Welcome and thank you for joining me today. When it comes to health and well being, one of the healthiest starts that we can give our babies is to breastfeed them. And many women do that. Now, before you go up oh, breastfeeding, this is not for me. I'm here to tell you that we are bringing a different twist to the idea of breastfeeding because it turns out that breastfeeding has significant health benefits for the baby, but it also can provide lifetime health benefits for the woman who is breastfeeding. And that is why today I am really excited to be talking with Kelly Durbin. She is a board certified lactation consultant and she has some fascinating information to share with us. Kelly, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me on today. This is really exciting. I really enjoy talking to people about maternal health and the benefits that result from breastfeeding. And they, like you said, these can last for years. So it's not a, a one time like, oh, I was nursing during this year and, and that's when I was well. No, this goes on and on. That's really cool. Uh, so before we dive into learning more about it, can you talk about your journey to becoming a board certified lactation consultant? Sure. Um, I'll try to keep it quick. <laughs> it started. <laughs> 18 years ago when I um, got pregnant with my oldest child. And during that time, I, I didn't, like many people, I did not have a very good handle on lactation or breastfeeding, but I thought, hey, this sounds like something I want to do. And as a child of the 70s, I wasn't breastfed as an infant. And mm. for some reason, that always bothered me just a little bit. But after I learned about the material that you and I are going to talk about today... I felt very um, cheated <laughs> in a way <laughs> because um, it, it does give infants such a great start in life. But knowing that once I learned that there are maternal benefits to this, I really felt like, well, this is my chance to, to get into this and have the benefit of doing, participating in lactation. Even if I didn't, wasn't able to do that on my infancy, here I am as a mother participating mm. at a high level. And I got more and more into it. My first daughter had some challenges. We, mm. like many, many people, we ran into tongue tie and she was born with a condition called torticollis, which was, um, and still is a situation for her. She's 17 today and it's, you know, still ongoing. Um, but as we got through the first year, I became more and more convinced that this is one of the missing pieces of adult health in the United States. And I really didn't want to let go of it. And unlike most people, I just couldn't get enough of this information. And by the time she was maybe one, I was thinking, you know, I talk to people, just anybody, I'll tell them how great breastfeeding is. And I thought, you know, I should really look into doing this as my new career. So during the time that my kids were very small, I became trained in lactation. Um, I became a volunteer breastfeeding support person, which is something I still do today um, through La Leche League International. And I felt that I just wanted to give back to some of the people that helped me along the way and be able to provide lactation support because once you learn a little bit about lactation, especially in the US, you start to realize that there are some major gaps in the lactation support landscape, and we are not preparing people very well for this. And I, I felt called to do it. I had been um, a middle school teacher. Mm. And once I realized that I could still teach, but I can change the my whole entire curriculum to childbirth and breastfeeding, far more exciting for me, I, I just jumped at it. It, it became you know, a sole focus. And a few years ago, um, I became board certified in lactation and then, you know, still going today. This is probably something I'll do for years. And and that's wonderful. You know, I, I find it so interesting listening to your story to think about how this is such a natural biological function and yet we know nothing about it. Nothing. 
Right. especially, you know, you become pregnant and either you, you are, or you aren't going to breastfeed, whatever, but nobody talks about it at all. Talks about the process, talks about what's going on. And then you shared, there are a number of health benefits that go on beyond the breastfeeding period. Can you talk about some of the ways that it, it supports maternal health to be able to breastfeed? Absolutely. So on day one, which is, of course, you're, you've just had this baby, you've given birth, the, the benefits to breastfeeding actually kick in within minutes. This wow. is kind of shocking, but um, it's the design of nature and really it actually functions quite well. When the baby is born and put to the breast right away, that stimulates an entire chemical and hormonal reaction within the body. And it begins to send hormonal messages to the uterus and the blood vessels where the placenta had been attached. Mm -hmm. And now it's detached. When the, the detachment takes place, there is a great risk for bleeding in that area. But as the baby latches, there's a signal that's sent, a nervous system signal from nerves in the breast to your brain that help to send the signal to the uterus to clamp down return the uterus to a, a shrunken size, not necessarily the same exact size within hours, but it starts to shrink, right? But the main signal in that, the outcome there is that the blood vessels get smaller and they're shrinking and they're clamping down. So when the infant latches in the first hours after birth, the uterus gets the signal to stop those blood vessels from flowing. And you, you are at far decreased risk of postpartum hemorrhage, even within hours of breastfeeding. Oh. So that's the very first outcome. And like I said, you don't have to breastfeed for years. That could be life-saving for many, many individuals, just breastfeeding in the first days, because you're sending your body the signal, the pregnancy is over. We're not, you know, we don't need to send a healthy blood supply to that space where the placenta was attached anymore. So it's a great tool. And I, I don't, I'm not meaning that in any joking way. It is a wonderful tool to mm -hmm. help shrink the uterus and clamp down those blood vessels immediately. So postpartum hemorrhage has um, some negative outcomes actually for breastfeeding. So if you do run into a situation where there's not necessarily an extreme hemorrhage, but a lot of blood loss that can contribute to damage to the pituitary gland and the mm -hmm. pituitary is in charge of prolactin, which makes your drives milk production. So people who do experience um, high levels of blood loss and of course, extreme blood loss can mm. have lactation dysfunction down the road. And mm. a lot of times people don't connect the two. They think, you know, okay, I'm glad the childbirth is over. I'm recovering. Why is my milk not coming in? Yeah. If you lost a lot of blood that could play into it. But again, breastfeeding can help minimize that risk. So mm -hmm. that's the very first benefit on day one, but it doesn't stop there. So we have noticed that people who, uh, science shows that those who are diagnosed with gestational diabetes mm -hmm. often have in the face of no breastfeeding, those individuals have a greater risk of developing diabetes later in life. Really? However, wow. they do. However, if you are breastfeeding, you are mitigating that increased risk. So anyone who's diagnosed with gestational diabetes, and these are folks who have never been diagnosed with diabetes before. Mm, sure. So if, right. Otherwise you wouldn't be diagnosed with gestational diabetes. You would already have diabetes. Have diabetes, but, right. So people who are newly diagnosed during pregnancy, and again, gestational diabetes is typically limited only to the pregnancy, but we know that the, the risk is increased for developing um, type two diabetes later in life. Breastfeeding can help mitigate that and decrease the risk of further. Oh. It's incredible. Um, other diabetes outcomes for people who say are already um, diabetic or they are taking insulin, there are some studies that show that breastfeeding in the first year can help decrease the maternal need for insulin. So you, let's say you were taking the, whatever dose of insulin, it may end up decreasing during your period of, of lactation because breastfeeding somehow modifies 
insulin resistance within the maternal hormonal system. Wow. So it's incredible. That's another huge benefit. So we, we know that um, people who are diabetic have better outcomes and people who were gestational diabetic have decreased risk of, of developing diabetes, which is, you know, anymore, it seems like that's one of our increasing conditions yeah, it, of it's uh, a, chronic illness. Diabetes in general is increasing in the population, unfortunately, just because of diet and other things. And I believe gestational diabetes is, is increased over where it was, you know, 20, 25 years ago. So Absolutely. that actually is a, a wonderful tip. And I want to come back to that at some point, because that brings up a question I need to ask you. But before we do that, I remember learning at one point that because I uh, breastfed my children, that apparently contributed to a reduced risk for cancer. Can you talk about that at all? Yes. So for in my research, I've come across three female cancers that are decreased by the risk of developing them is decreased by breastfeeding. So mm -hmm. first let's talk about um, breast cancer. It is maybe one of the leading cancers for women in the country. I'm not exactly sure what the statistic is on that, but it's very, it's high up there. Um, breastfeeding, this is something I always found interesting. I read a study years ago that said, if you were breastfed as an infant, as a female, you have a lower risk of developing breast cancer over the course mm -hmm. of your lifetime. Wow. But if you're also coming back to breastfeeding as a mother, you decrease your risk even further. So for someone like me, I was born in the seventies. I was not breastfed. So I didn't get that protection to begin with. But once I learned this, as we were talking about earlier at the top, once I learned about this, I thought, well, my own mother had lost a breast to breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And I thought, here I am with this known information. I'm in the middle of pregnancy and breastfeeding. I want to make sure that I take advantage of modifying my risk by doing what I can to breastfeed my own children. Plus at the same time, not only am I lowering my risk, my kids are girls. So I was also oh, lowering man. their risk as well. So that breast cancer is one. Um, another one is ovarian cancer. So ovarian cancer is um, incidence is decreased by breastfeeding. And this one is particularly um, interesting to me because at the moment, and you may already know this, ovarian cancer is harder to detect and it mm -hmm. has a, yeah. a longer silence period while it's developing. And so once uh, a person notices or finds out that they have ovarian cancer, it's generally a later stage than what we would discover for breast cancer. Sure. And so the outcomes for, um, for healing, for survival, for ovarian are actually worse than breast cancer. And I'm, um, I don't know what the exact statistics are, but breastfeeding moderates that risk as well. So mm -hmm. by breastfeeding, you are cutting your risk for future uh, ovarian diagnoses, which is something that I, I don't know that people talk about it all that much. Breast cancer gets all the media. So yeah. ovarian it, cancer it is- and, and but I think also it's it's fascinating to hear how there are these strategies that we can do that contribute to the body's ability to reduce the risk. I mean, it doesn't mean that if you breastfeed, you're never going to get cancer, but certainly anything exactly that right. we do that can reduce the risk and even better reduce the risk for our children is really a, a significant thing. And I just find myself astonished at how little that our country seems to value breastfeeding. I agree. I do. Well, one study that I read showed that um, there is a dose response relationship. So the more you breastfeed, the more you're increasing your advantages. In other words, you're decreasing your risks the longer term you go. And um, one of the studies I read on ovarian cancer says that you could reduce your risk by up to 24%. That is an incredible risk. Now, as you just mentioned, that doesn't mean that it erases your risk or takes your risk to zero. However, it is a, a good strategy for modifying your risk. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned there were three kinds of cancer. What's the, the third? The third one that has some good research behind it is endometrial cancer, which oh. isn't as the incidence of endometrial cancer, I don't believe is as high as breast cancer, but it's also one that is um, frequently diagnosed and breastfeeding has been shown to reduce incidence of endometrial cancer in the years following breastfeeding. Wow. That's, that's really astonishing. It you, is. You know, I, so, so coming back to the question, I want to ask you he, hearing that if you have gestational diabetes, you're more likely to develop diabetes. And so breastfeeding can help mitigate that knowing that there are studies that show that breastfeeding is so beneficial for helping to reduce the risk for cancer or uh, other issues going on. I find myself astonished at how little we, we value breastfeeding, as I said, in this country. And I know, for example, when I had my kids, now I did, I did breastfeed all three of them for varying amounts of time, but, uh, the first thing that came into the room with the kid was a packet of, of formula. And the big push seemed to be like, oh, you could just breastfeed that. You Sorry, you could just bottle feed that baby. And, and really, it seemed astonishing to me that, first of all, breast milk is cheap and freely available. Uh, but there's this huge push among pediatricians and hospitals to subvert that process. And I, I just find myself astonished when it's so healthy that they would rather you go to formula. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yes. <laughs> so it is an incredibly complex relationship that started in hospitals years and years ago. And I, I've read things from, you know, the forties, fifties, and sixties that showed that, you know, that was when marketing from the point of view of the hospital and in hospital um, samples, like the ones you were given right after birth started so long ago that it's, it's just entrenched. And what's happened is the unethical marketing of formula has never been really checked or stopped or put limits in the United States. So I'm sure you recall that years ago, the tobacco industry and even alcohol um, yeah. underwent an entire change of, and it was related to the marketing of these products. Yeah. I think even recently, we all know or have recognized that marketing uh, vaping to teens and cigarettes to teens has become a problem. And they, there's no way that the government doesn't step in and say, okay, we've overstepped our bounds. However, they no one has ever really taken our great steps in the US. This has happened outside of the US, but not here, to overhaul the formula marketing within the United States because it has been aggressive. It has been unethical. Mm -hmm. um, the way that they will, uh, um, I'm sorry, infant formula manufacturers will get incentives to pediatricians and doctor's offices, hospitals to push their product um, in subtle and not so subtle ways, you know, the free gift of formula as you, as you're walking out the hospital with your newborn, it's the bag has a little sample of formula or maybe a, a big, a large can, but also accompanied by a whole booklet of coupons and ways that will incentivize you to continue using their product. But the, the, the roots of this are really, really deep and it would take us hours to discuss all of it but it also comes down to um several the point where at which it came together involved a whole lot of factors but in the 90s um i think the united states either got close to or was considering signing on to the world health organization um code for marketing of infant formula substitute or infant breast milk substitutes. I'm getting the name wrong, but the WHO code is what we call it now because of the World Health Organization name. The, the many countries in the world have signed on and those in many places, you are not targeted as a new mother. Mm -hmm. Here in the US, aggressive marketing and unethical marketing continues even as you said, in doctor's offices, in hospitals. Now I will tell you about one recent innovation since you and I had our kids, 
um, there is an initiative called the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative. And in Baby Friendly Hospitals, there is no formula marketing. It is dedicated specifically to breastfeeding. And these, to get the designation of Baby Friendly, the mm -hmm. hospital must spend a ton of money and go through this accreditation process. However, they do have better breastfeeding outcomes, better breastfeeding rates on discharge, and they do not allow any marketing of formula. And that doesn't mean that they don't use it. It's just, it's hidden away. It's not pushed on people. Or, you know, it's still there in the event that someone needs it, but it's and, not. And a, um, I, I love that because I, I feel like, as I mentioned, you know, you would go to your OBGYN, you know, your pregnancy visits and there's formula advertising. And then you go to the pediatrician yes. and there's formula advertising, like you're surrounded by it, which is really overwhelming. Um, I And I do know that there is a small percentage of women who, for one reason or another, are unable to successfully breastfeed. And so it, it's a it's a good thing that formula is there for those babies, because I think we don't tend to do the wet nurse thing anymore. That was a long time ago. Um, but I'm I'm also curious to know if you have any suggestions for how people can connect with a lactation specialist if they're having a problem. Because I, I mean, I was very fortunate. It, it was a process that worked well for me and my children, but I can only imagine if you're sitting there by yourself and you don't know what to do, or it's not working or it's not helping. And you try to talk to the pediatrician who goes, well, here, just take this formula. You know, they're, they're not supported. So how does a, how does a woman or a family find someone like you to help them learn how to make this process work. So you brought up a great point. When you go to the pediatrician, many people don't realize that they're talking to someone who has no training in lactation. Mm. So you may go to your pediatrician's office thinking, oh, I'll just ask the doctor about this on our visit next week or tomorrow or whatever. Pediatricians typically have no training or very little training in lactation support, clinical management, breastfeeding management. They don't have skills for evaluating breastfeeding. And this is, I guess, becoming a little bit less. Um, I mean, what I'm, what I think I'm trying to say is they are maybe adjusting the curriculum at med school a little bit, but even as recent as 2020, I read an article that said doctors are still dissatisfied with the um, lactation education that they're getting. So they're not feeling supported in that way. And the people who are trained are individuals who seek additional training outside of med school. So if, you're, if your pediatrician is trained, that's a wonderful experience for you, but it's very um, rare, uncommon in the United yeah. States. It is very rare. Okay, so how does somebody find good breastfeeding support? This is a great question. At the hospital, you may run into someone in your experience while you're there, someone who is trained in lactation, but a lot of times it will be a nurse who may or may not have lactation skills from the degree of like a board certified lactation consultant to that kind of uh, level. Once you leave the hospital though, many women are like, at home the first few days and they're thinking, okay, it was great when I had a little bit of support or I knew I could ask the nurse, but now I've got nobody and I don't know what I'm doing. Mm. So there are several options. Um, one, and this is a really good option, especially now that we are all connected on devices online, yeah. that you can access free volunteer breastfeeding support basically anywhere. And these kinds of organizations exist nationwide, but they're all online. So if you're in a rural area or you're, you feel like, oh, th that doesn't exist in my city, you don't have to go face to face. So some of the organizations are um, La Leche League USA, La Leche League Alliance, which is um, it's, it's part of the same organization of La Leche League International, Breastfeeding USA, uh, Baby Cafe, and there are others, even smaller ones around the country. I know Detroit has um, a nursing mothers group that is specifically for African-American women supporting them in the Detroit area. And so there are other places. You just have to get on Google and look up where can I find volunteer breastfeeding support or go to, um, there is a great webpage called Kelly Mom. I have no affiliation with her. It's just another, 
person who happens to be named Kelly. Um, and she often has really, really well-organized information about topics and something like this, like where could I go for breastfeeding support in the U S mm -hmm. this is a, she's an RN she's based in Florida. So she has a lot of good um, information out there on her page specifically regarding the United States. Um, but any of those organizations that I just mentioned would be the first line. If you're already experiencing a high level of difficulty, I would suggest locating a lactation consultant by using Google, just mm -hmm. typing in, you know, doing a good search, lactation consultants in the city where you live or nearby if you're, like I said, if you're out in a rural area. Um, I occasionally publish research on breastfeeding access and how people find lactation consultants and lactation support. And a few years ago, maybe two years ago, we, we looked at Ohio. And it turns out in rural areas, there are very few professional lactation consultants that you could access face-to-face. -face. But the good news is a lot of lactation providers have recently, since the pandemic, um, taken on telelactation, meaning they will see you and visit with you in the same yeah. way that you and I are doing this talk right now. We're doing sure. it online on Zoom. Sure. So a Zoom call for breastfeeding is in fact a reality. Mm -hmm. And having telehealth is one way to um, connect. Now there are um, at least one or two breastfeeding companies nationwide where people can just search for lactation consultants Mm -hmm. Um, but that would be something that would be more likely you do through your insurance company. Mm -hmm. Another thing that you may want to do as a new parent is find out what your insurance is going to pay for. Look in the policy and, and figure out, because a lot of times it will say things like, we will cover lactation education in the prenatal period or childbirth education. But once the baby is born, that benefit disappears. The mm -hmm. same is true for lactation. You may find that your insurance policy says we will cover six visits, but they have to be all within the first 12 weeks of breastfeeding or 20 weeks or something like that. So they, they really do outline it in a way that it's confined to the specific period of the beginning of lactation. And for different companies will... Um, put limits on it in different ways. So it pays to find out what is- Yeah, if covered. you know in advance, then you can plan so that you're able to maximize that benefit. Absolutely. And some plans will actually cover your purchase of a breast pump, which many people are using. If you go back to work, you're going to need a pump or it's likely that you will. Your insurance company may cover that. Mm -hmm. So That's it very pays cool. to- yeah, it just to dig into your policy and find out what benefits do I have in terms of lactation. Mm -hmm. And and you know I I love that you've shared so much of this you know healthy for the baby some of these beautiful health benefits for the the mother as well and then different resources that people can reach out to. I uh, I think one thing that impresses me the most that I really like and that I hope a lot of people will take away from this is even if you were not breastfed yourself or even if you were someone who who wound up growing up in a time where you were not encouraged to breastfeed your child and so you bottle fed them for people to become breastfeeding advocates like it's never too late to change and to support those women in your life who are now looking at at trying to, you know, make that lifestyle change and to incorporate breastfeeding because it's just healthy for everybody. It is indeed. And I do believe that at some point, most adults in the U S will play a role in breastfeeding support. So mm -hmm. it, it does pay off. Even if you're not the one participating at a high level, it could be that you're supporting someone who is. That's really wonderful. Well, Kelly, this has been such a great talk. Thank you so much for sharing your information and for sharing some of these resources. I will make sure to list those down below. So if anybody wants to find them and connect with them and, and for anyone who's watching, I hope the big takeaway that you will take from this is that breastfeeding is actually a lifetime benefit thing that we can do to improve not only our own lives, but the lives of future generations as well. 
So Kelly, thank you so much for being here and, and sharing with us. And for everyone who's watching, make sure you check the links down below. And as always, make sure that in all you do today is a healthy day. Bye, folks. Thank you.